A Titan is pretty big, but is it big enough? We'll find out this week on Motoring 2004. Motoring 2004 is brought to you by Quaker State Motor Oil, oils fine-tuned for different engines, and Midas, Total Car Care, we do that. Ah, the good old days. When I was a youngster, that was a phrase I heard often by the old folk, and now i got to admit this old guy is doing the same, but the question still remains, when were the good old days? Well, if you're a car maker, the answer to that one is quite simple. It was prior to the Japanese invasion. Back then, consumers had fewer choices, and loyalty played a major role in the decision-making. Well, of course, today, with such a crowded market, loyalty for this generation is almost non-existent, with one exception, the full-size pickup truck. The domestics, Ford, Chevy, and Dodge continue to rule the roost. Now, a few years ago, Toyota took a run at it with the Tundra, and this week, we're going to check out the newest Japanese entry. They're calling it the Nissan Titan. And Nissan is convinced that they have accomplished what Toyota failed to do, and that is to offer a full-size pickup truck to North America built by an import manufacturer. Well, we realized it was an obvious opportunity. The full-size pickup market is a huge market in North America. Roughly about 12% of the total market is that is our pickup trucks. So we knew there was an opportunity. You're right, we've been selling the Frontier pickup for almost 30 years. And so we've got a real history of building pickups. And this was a market that we just wanted to get into. We're the first market uh, with a compact pickup truck. Now we're coming with a full-size pickup truck, bringing some of those same innovations that we had with the compact truck into full-size. So we're going to be the first with a wide-open door, first with factory spray and bed liner, the first with a channel system in the bed, the largest second row room in the crew cab. So we believe we've come to market with quite an innovative product. Full-size pickup. You can only really describe it by looking at its competitors. So if you're going to set it up beside a Ford, a Chev, and a Dodge, it uh, it better have the same wheelbase, uh, height, width. Um, it's got to have the look. I've driven the Dodge Hemi and the Titan back to back, and at the moment, I'd have to say that they're very comparable. Certainly. Uh, Neither one seems to have a, a huge advantage over the other, but on the other hand, those two right now are at the top of the heap. Now, Toyota took a run at it uh, a few years ago with, with, with the Tundra. They set up a whole new truck division, but you're not impressed. Well, not really. Um, you know, we believe if you're going to do a full-size pickup, you better do one that truly is full-size. And we kind of refer to the Tundra as a 7 8 truck. It, it just wasn't a full-size truck. In this case, uh, we're going to have a 5.6-liter V8, class-leading torque, uh, class-leading horsepower, class-leading uh, uh, towing capability, 9,500 pounds of towing capability. I mean, this is a full-size truck in every way. Well, it's a noble objective. Uh, I think they're right in that, that Toyota being a bit smaller than the, the domestic competition uh, didn't really crack the market. Uh, so they certainly have a much better opportunity to do so given the specs on this truck. And I, and I think they've done their homework in terms of uh, what the truck is. It's everything that rationally a uh, North American truck buyer seems to want. Whether that's enough, hard to say. I, I really wonder how many people buy pickup trucks on a rational basis. The growth area in the truck market is the personal use truck or what they're calling the modern day trucker uh, and those are the people that probably don't need all the capability this this truck has uh, so I wonder if they're even going to be able to appreciate it. We do have to go head-to-head -head against the domestics 
the GMs, Fords, and Dodges of the world. And we have to have some innovations in our product that will draw some of their people away. Now, from a total percentage standpoint, to achieve our volume objectives in the marketplace, we don't need to, to take away 10, 15 percent of their people. We just need three, four, five percent of their people to come look at us. And if we can do that, we'll be successful. All right. It's Let's got a lot it. of power. It's real smooth riding, quiet, comfortable. Accelerates good. I mean, runs real good. Nice job. The traditional trucker, he's a guy that's really interested in trucks and he's deeply into what trucks are all about. And you know what? I have a feeling he just will going to he's going to come into a dealership just to check it out because he wants to see, did Nissan really build a full-size truck? Did they do what they said? And what's going to happen is he's going to find out, yeah, we did. George Orwell was right. Big Brother is watching. But Georgie, lighten up. More later on Kenzie's Corner. When I gave the Toyota Echo my car of the year a couple of years back, the reaction was universal. Are you blind? Well, no, I'm not, because the beauty of a car is much more than skin deep. This week on Test Drive, we take another look at the Echo, but this time, well, it's not quite such an ugly duckling. As with the sedan, the Echo hatch is powered by a sophisticated 1.5-litre twin cam that benefits from variable valve timing. This technology delivers 108 horsepower and 105 pound-speed of torque over a surprisingly broad range and none of the nasty vibes so common on other inexpensive cars. Regardless of whether married to the standard 5-speed manual box or the 4-speed automatic, the PEP is better than the numbers suggest. Even at higher speeds, there is some semblance of passing power and only when whipped does the engine begin to get a tad noisy. Mind you, given the Echo's frugal habits, this is easily overlooked. The official numbers say 6.7 litres per 100 kilometres in the city and 5.2 on the highway. All Echo hatchbacks come with front discs, rear drums and standard anti-lock brakes at long last. You know, it's about time the cost-conscious consumer was given the safety benefit of anti-lock brakes. The basic suspension is fairly simple in design but manages to deliver a comfortable ride and reasonable handling. Up front, long stroke McPherson struts smooth the rigors of a rough road, while a torsion beam rear design imparts some tow correction. Now, the latter adds stability during fast cornering and under heavy braking. The really neat part about this Echo hatch is the way it can be customized. For instance, you can add as much vroom and boom as you want. The vroom comes from this baller exhaust system. It really does spruce up the exhaust note. Add to that the cold air intake that you can buy and well, you get a couple of horsepower. Not much, but nothing to sneeze at. As for the boom factor, well, it's right here, this massive 10 inch subwoofer. Now, by way of interest, none of the Echoes come from the factory with a radio installed. Rather, you go to the dealership, pick the unit you want, and they put it in. Now, in our case, we picked an MP3 player that set us back 190 bucks. But the really neat part, you know, well, it comes down to a TRD suspension kit you can buy. It not only lowers the car, it also improves the handling without sacrificing the ride comfort whatsoever. The best part, however, it allows these upsized 14-inch wheels to fill the wheel wells, which really does round out the look. The TRD suspension upgrade also delivers a much-needed cross-car brace up front that adds to the body's integrity enormously. Likewise, the effects of the larger p 19560 r 14 tires should not be underestimated. The grip supplied keeps understeer in check, as well as making the variable assist steering suitably responsive. Indeed, through the pylons, the revamped suspension played a very big part in keeping the hatch on an even keel. You know, considering the dimensions of the Echo, the rear seat space is quite extraordinary. Plenty of headroom, plenty of legroom, and because the seat sits well off the floor, you've actually got somewhere to put your feet. Now, if you happen to have an unhappy passenger, may I suggest you sit them on the left-hand side of the vehicle. The reason? Well, that subwoofer's bolted to the back of this backrest. You play a heavy bass track, and let's just say, well, 
they'll get out a lot happier than when they got in. Elsewhere, the Echo's entry-level status shows up in the form of self-crank windows and some interior plastics that are marginal at best. On the flip side, a couple of large bins on either side of the radio and climate control, twin glove boxes and a pair of large cup holders ensures the junk carried on an everyday basis has a readily accessible home. This new Echo hatch really is as fun to drive as it is functional. And because it gets standard anti-lock brakes, well, the entry-level consumer can now get the safety they've always wanted and I've always pushed for. But the really neat part about this car, you can walk in, plunk down $12,995 and you've got basic transportation. If you go in and throw a little more cash at it, well, you end up with a really funky set of wheels like this RS tester. Now we've reached the purpose of this whole extravaganza and that is to announce our car of the year for 2003. Ladies and gentlemen, may I present the Mazda 6. The all new Mazda 6 was still fresh out of the box when it received Motoring's car of the year award for 2003. Now can the vehicle live up to these accolades? Well, to find out, we've added the Mazda 6 to our long-term fleet and over the next few months, We'll see how the car stacks up in one of the industry's most competitive segments. Our Midas Tip of the Week concerns fuel economy. You know, the higher that fuel prices get, the more email and the more inquiries I get from people looking to improve their fuel economy. So over the next couple of weeks, we're going to focus on that. Now, it looks like I don't have much in the back of my pickup truck here, and I don't in terms of volume, but there's a considerable amount of weight. I've got a full five gallon can of gas, a couple of jugs of water, a floor jack and safety stands. They don't look like much, but they're steel and collectively there's probably a couple hundred pounds right there. A case of motor oil and a brake rotor and caliper here, it all adds up. Now you might think that only applies to trucks, but when I'm in the trunk of people's cars looking for this wheel lock tool to remove the wheels to do a brake job, I notice a lot of people are carrying multiple jugs of washer fluid extra rad fluid, extra motor oil, all kinds of heavy stuff in the trunk of their car. Liquids are very heavy, of course, so if you get them out of there, if you don't absolutely need to have them in there, that's going to help your fuel economy. Now remember, when you're purchasing a vehicle as well, the lighter vehicle always wins the battle when it comes to fuel economy. And weight is a vicious circle. Add weight to the vehicle, you need a bigger engine, you need bigger wheels and tires, bigger springs to carry it, it's a vicious circle. So buy the lightweight vehicle if you're looking for fuel economy. Now one other area where you can really make improvements is tire pressure. According to Natural Resources Canada, if, you're, if all four of your tires on your vehicle are down just 2 PSI, that'll increase your fuel consumption by 1%. So make sure you're keeping regular tabs on tire pressure. We'll talk about more pieces of the fuel mileage puzzle over the next few weeks. That's your Midas tip of the week. Ladies and gentlemen, the new Rolls-Royce Phantom. We think our brand, Rolls-Royce, is literally the byword for excellence. And we've just introduced what I think is a fabulous product. Tradition is really important, but what we did as a team, we went right back to the roots of Rolls-Royce. What made it such a legend in the first place? It was just sheer peerless engineering, the best possible engineering. And that's the credo that we put throughout the whole motor car. Each and every engineering decision has been taken back to first principles to do the very best that we, know, we think anyone could do in a motor car. So that's a tremendous challenge, but uh, that's the objective that we try to live up to. It's important, it's a very lightweight motor car in terms of its materials and its design. So fully aluminium structure and lots of use of magnesium and aluminium castings throughout it. So it's, it's about, um, about two and a half tons in weight total. Um, but the way the engine is tuned and the gearing um, means that we can get quite astonishing performance from that. Straight from pickup, we have over 75% of the maximum torque of the engine immediately available. So it's an effortless 
performance and it reaches 60 miles per hour in 5.7 seconds. Now we have the chance with the BMW Group's sensitive handling of the brand but all of their engineering capability to put all that together and make a true Rolls Royce of automobiles for today. We're back here with our Nissan Titan. This is the King Cab version. Now getting in and out of these vehicles can be awkward. No problem with the front door, but when you open the back door, you find yourself in a very tight situation. Well, Nissan has thought of everything. They call it the open door concept because the door opens all the way. How about that? Now earlier we saw how Nissan is not going after the traditional trucker. They're going after the modern day trucker. Well, what is that? Well, probably a guy like me that doesn't like wearing socks and spends his lifetime in sandals. But you know, the real trucker in the motoring family, of course, is Bill Gardner, a domestic Chevy kind of guy, although we have convinced him to do a long-term test on a Toyota Tundra. So let's head to the Quaker State Garage, see how that is going, and find out if Bill thinks that Nissan or Toyota can really get a big bite out of the full-size market. Hey Brad, is it any wonder they want a chunk of that market? Number one and number two selling vehicles worldwide. Number one, the Ford pickup. Number two, the Chevy pickups. So it's no wonder that the imports want a piece of that full-size truck market. And I'm sure they're going to make some inroads. I think where their niche is going to be is the buyer who wants a full-size pickup basically as a second car or for light duty or recreational use, for towing a trailer, for you know, light, what I classify as light duty recreational vehicle use. That's where they're really going to appeal. Now, in terms of market share, well, facts just out in the last couple of days, Toyota has moved into third place in Canada. Their sales are up 21% in the last month. They're now calling it the big four with Toyota in third place and Daimler Chrysler pushed back to fourth. So they're certainly making inroads in all market segments. Now, in terms of all the different market segments, think about it for a minute what segment don't the imports either already own or have made significant inroads into. The one segment that they don't own right now is full-size pickups and they're certainly moving in there. So anybody's guess as to how far they make it. Now, I want to show you one thing that's really impressed me about the Tundra. We're going to move to the back of the truck here and you're going to see just why full-size pickups are easier to sell to everybody these days for all kinds of use. Now, when I get on the tailgate of this truck, and bounce it, you can see how easily that suspension moves. It's very compliant and there's lots of travel. Makes for a great ride. This is the best riding truck that I've driven with the box empty. Now most of the domestic pickups ride better after you put six or eight hundred pounds in the box. It kind of takes the sting out of them. But everybody's full-size pickups, as they keep getting re-engineered and redesigned over the years, ride and handling is greatly improved. And that's one of the big reasons why it's so easy to sell these vehicles to a broader market, market share than it ever was. It's appealing to people because these things ride great. Now, I would have thought that as, as good as this suspension is in the Tundra, that you know, usually what you gain on one end, you lose on the other. So I thought load carrying capability would be compromised but I've used it for a number of construction projects this summer. Had a lot of concrete mix in the back, lots of topsoil, sod, clay, et cetera, in the back of this truck, and I've driven it with lots of load in it, and the ride and handling is great, even with, even with maximum load in it. So it seems like you can have the best of both worlds now, and isn't that what everybody wants? Till next week, I'm Bill Gardner for Motoring 2004. You know, there's one thing about the city of Toronto I've never figured out. How can there be a city of over three million people, half of whom come from Winnipeg? But you know, we can learn a lot from Winnipeg. How to play rock and roll from the Guess Who, how to be funny like David Steinberg or Larry Zolf, and it turns out, how to use modern traffic safety technology. Now they've been running photo radar and red light cameras in Winnipeg since early 2003, but they're doing it in an intelligent way. Among other things, they're not putting their photo radar units on our safest, fastest highways like we did in Toronto, like they did in BC and Alberta. They're actually putting them in construction zones, in school zones, where you want people to go slow. Makes sense. They're not only saving lives, but they're making some money too. Nothing wrong with that. 
In fact, they're actually going to hire a researcher to do a five-year study on this program to make sure they are, in fact, saving lives. I think it'll prove all right, particularly for these red light cameras. Now, a lot of people thought I'd be opposed to red light cameras because I opposed the way photo radar was applied in Ontario and in BC. Wrong. I'm all in favor of red light cameras. There's no excuse for running a red light. Nail these guys to hides to the wall as often as you can possibly catch them. We can't have a cop on every street corner. We could have a camera on every street corner. But you know the best story that's come out of Winnipeg so far? There's one guy there who's had four photo radar speeding violations and three red light camera infractions all at the same intersection. Talk about a guy who doesn't quite get the picture. Now he actually complained to the police. He phoned them and said, stop hassling me. And the cop said, well, did it ever occur to you to slow down? Did it ever occur to you to maybe stop at this intersection since you know it's got a red light camera there? His response was, I've got places to go. Well, I've got two places you might go, buddy. One is the slammer, and the second might be Portage and Maine, January 15th. We'll see how long you last there. I'm Jim Kenzie. Before we go, some first impressions on the new Nissan Titan after a day behind the wheel. It's got the power, it's got the size, and I think it's got the looks to turn a few heads. And you know, in this environment, that's a big step in the right direction. And of course, the company is hoping that direction takes you right into a Nissan showroom. And if you get there, you may notice that Nissan is not only now into full-size pickup trucks, but also full-size sport utilities. Behind me is the Pathfinder Armada, and we'll take a much closer look at this vehicle on a future program as we continue to bring you more stories about cars and the people who drive them. There's more power, better handling, and better braking, and uh, exclusivity. I mean, this is the car if you want to have something different, and bang for the buck, you know, the Mustang itself has always been uh, the winner in that category, and like I said, we've just pushed that envelope a little farther. TSN's Motoring 2004 has been brought to you by Quaker State Motor Oil, oils fine-tuned for different engines, and Midas, total car care, we do that.